It is my pleasure to welcome you all here uh, on this Wednesday, before a long holiday, uh, to uh, attend a talk which I personally have been very much looking forward to. James Cooper uh, received his PhD from the University of Aberystwyth, of course, as we all know, one of the great institutions for political science and history in the United Kingdom. He is most famous, I believe, for his book on the relationship between Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, uh, a relation that he concludes was much more contested than many tends to assume. He is here to address us on a topic uh, that was raised uh, by Professor John McNay in his talk, the relationship between American presidents and the Northern Irish peace process. Professor Cooper, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming today. Before I start, I should mention the hope for my wife is watching online. Today is actually our third wedding anniversary. So, Danielle, if you're watching, um, next year I promise we will be in the same time zone and uh, the same country as well. And it will just be the two of us rather than a crowd full of very nice people. So, happy anniversary, um, Danielle. Okay, so US presidents and Northern Ireland. Um, Clinton Rossiter, writing in the New York Times in 1956, argued that American presidents have a global role, due, and due to the United States' wealth and military power, they'll always be able to influence questions of stability and freedom beyond America's borders. The American president as a peacemaker is vital to any discussion about the causes of and mission for peace in an interconnected world. The awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to, to three serving American presidents and Jimmy Carter's award in 2002 all underlines this notion. Three factors determine whether a president is able to act as a peacemaker. The initiative to seize an opportunity, the ability to succeed using the available military or diplomatic means, and matching expectations at home and abroad. During the, during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, successive American presidents were challenged to meet the various expectations of Irish American groups and politicians, the peoples of Ireland and Northern Ireland, and the British and Irish governments. These expectations were countered by broader American grand strategy during the Cold War, whereby the apolitical career officials at the State Department cautioned neutral, neutral, neutrality on the issue. Each of the peacemaking criteria was achieved by Bill Clinton's role in the 1998 Good Friday Agreement that brought peace to Northern Ireland. However, this paper will argue that a historian should examine Clinton's achievements within the context of his predecessor's policies towards the Troubles in order to secure more nuanced assessments about his individual role in the, in the Northern Ireland peace process. The Troubles affected Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and the British mainland from the late 1960s until arguably the signing of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. This is a period of paramilitary sectarian violence caused by divisions over the constitutional relationship between Northern Ireland and London and Catholic inequality in Northern Ireland. To put it very broadly, put it quite simply, the majority Protestant unionist community wanted Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK. The minority Catholic nationalist community sought a reunified Ireland. Broadly, loyalists refer to militant unionists, such as the Ulster Volunteer Force and Ulster Defence Association. And likewise, Republicans were militant and paramilitary nationalists revolving around the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. During the War of Independence, or the Irish War of Independence, 1919 to 21, Irish Americans financially supported the Irish Republican Army. However, Irish Americans broadly lost interest in Irish affairs after the 1921 Irish Treaty, Anglo-Irish Treaty. They were content that the old country was on path towards independence. The partition of Northern Ireland did not capture their imagination. During the early decades of the Cold War, the United States further downgraded its interest in Ireland, favoring the Anglo-American special relationship. Problems in Northern Ireland were viewed as domestic issues for the British government. 
The Irish government in the 1960s hoped that President John F. Kennedy, given, given his Irish Catholic heritage, would help end partition. In March 1963, Thomas J. Keenan, the Irish ambassador to the United States, asked Kennedy whether he would consider urging the British government to publicly commit to it. Kennedy replied that the British Prime Minister would never ever do this. When Keenan later suggested to Kennedy, prior to his visit to Ireland, that partition would likely be, be a topic of conversation with Eamon de Valera, the President of Ireland, and Sean Lamus, the Taoiseach, President Kennedy looked as if another headache had struck him. Eamon de Valera visited the United States in May 1964, so a year later, and met with Kennedy's successor, Lyndon B. Johnson. But LBJ was advised to avoid any discussion about partition. About partition. His position in relation to that of Kennedy's was best characterised by Ambassador Keenan's report to the Irish government. He said, and I quote, President Johnson's attitude to Ireland and the Irish will be warm and friendly, certainly 1964, but of course without, de without depth of feeling. 1964, of course, was an election year in the United States and the many Irish-American votes to be had. Johnson's neutrality was evident in the response to lobbying about Northern Ireland. And this neutrality was credited to Anglo-American relations. So, for example, Representative James A. Burke wrote to Johnson in March 1965, arguing that the partition of Ireland should be placed on the agenda of the United Nations. LBJ didn't himself reply, and it's unlikely that he even saw the letter. Instead, his Assistant Secretary of State for Congressional Relations replied to Burke stating that the administration wanted to maintain and strengthen its close relations with both Britain and Ireland. Therefore, it was the United States government's policy that the best course of friendship was to allow the British and the Irish to work out their differences in their own way. The closing months of the Johnson administration coincided with the advent of the Troubles, and LBJ, of course, was occupied by the Vietnam War and didn't want his administration to be distracted but what was viewed to be a British internal problem. Like JFK, he prioritised other foreign policy issues and American diplomatic and military capital were used elsewhere. The expectations of Irish Americans and the Irish governments were tempered. So moving on then to the Nixon and Ford administrations. Um, in his 1969 inaugural address, Richard Nixon was clear in his, was clear in his mission. He said, the greatest honour history can, best can bestow is the title of peacemaker. That's actually on Richard uh, Nixon's epitaph at the Nixon Library. Subsequently, Irish Americans and the Irish government attempted to persuade Nixon to intervene in Northern Ireland. However, Northern Ireland remained a marginalised issue and negated Nixon's own personal interest in it. In a context of discrimination, rioting, violence, and troop deployments in Northern Ireland, members of the US House of Representatives lobbied President Nixon. Nixon was asked to instruct the US representatives at the UN Security Council to preserve, and I quote, the human rights of the Catholic people of Northern Ireland. And he was warned that uh, there would be potential congressional resolutions calls are calling for this. A few weeks later, Henry Kissinger, the National Security Advisor, replied, he agreed, and I quote, on the need to protect the rights of all citizens in a free society, and explained that the administration had made this known to the British. However, he argued that UN action will be inappropriate, as it was a British internal domestic situation. At this time, Patrick Hillary, the Irish Foreign Minister, met with uh, William Rogers, the US Secretary of State. Hillary argued that the British government could not exclude the Irish government as, I quote, it is one tragic aspect of several hundred years of Irish history. Rogers explained that the Nixon administration did not wish to interfere in problems between our good friends, and that any advice would be presumptuous given America's unsolved problems. Rogers stressed that the British government knew the administration and hoped this would be dealt with, and that Hillary should feel free, however, to contact the US ambassador in Ireland about any matters he might wish to raise. Between the 27th of September and the 8th of October 1970, Nixon himself undertook a European tour. Nixon's visit to Ireland prompted the Irish Embassy in the United States to unearth a letter and article 
which demonstrated the President's views towards Northern Ireland while serving as a US Senator and campaigning to be Dwight Eisenhower's Vice President in 1952. Nixon had written to Reverend Dean Manning in June 1952, stating that he actually opposed Irish partition. And in an, in, in an interview with the Boston Daily Globe in September 1952, Nixon said that while partition could not be ended immediately, the United States government could pressure the British government to do so as a condition for American financial aid. Now, given that, that it's the Boston Daily Globe, Nixon had politicized the issue. He was arguing that the Republican Party and an Eisenhower administration would be better placed to end partic partic partition rather than a complacent Democratic Party who, told Irish, who took Irish-American votes for granted. But Nixon's past statements were soon forgotten. Kissinger briefed the president that he should avoid becoming involved in the debate over Irish partition during his visit. On the 5th of October 1970, Nixon met with Jack Lynch, then the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, at Dublin Castle. The American record of the meeting stated, and I quote, participants did not refer to Northern Ireland, but it is possible that these matters could have been touched upon at a private session. Nixon again met Lynch in March 1971 to mark St. Patrick's Day. Prior to what Kissinger described as, a, as Lynch's unofficial private visit, Nixon was warned that he would raise Northern Ireland. According to the Irish record, the conversation was scheduled to last half an hour, but Lynch and Nixon spoke for over an hour, I think about an hour and 20 minutes to be exact. Northern Ireland was discussed. The Taoiseach wanted to convince Nixon of the Irish government's view of the Northern Ireland situation so that he would privately steer Edward Heath, the British Prime Minister, towards a solution along those lines. The Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, was unsuccessful. A month later, Nixon met with Harold Wilson, who was at that point the leader of Her Majesty's Opposition, leader of the Labour Party, um, in April 1971. Nixon was advised that this was an opportunity to seek Wilson's opinion of the Northern Ireland situation. That Nixon was advised to ask for Wilson's opinion about Northern Ireland is indicative of his administration's increasing interest in the issue, because Wilson, of course, had been the Prime Minister, and therefore wasn't just a standard opposition leader, he'd actually been in power and responsible for some decisions in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Nixon continued to be unsuccessfully lobbied by Irish-American groups. His administration's response was that, and I quote, any intervention, any intervention on our part would only exasperate and not help to resolve the situation. Any hopes of a political accommodation between the Unionists and the Nationalists in Northern Ireland were dashed within a significant intensification of violence in 1971 with the advent of internment. Heath wrote to Nixon to explain this new development. That the British Prime Minister wrote to the American President to explain these developments is illustrative of the administration's concern for Northern Ireland, but also, crucially, the British acceptance of the President's global role. On the 17th of March, 1972, Nixon met with the Irish ambassador, William Warnock, to receive a shamrock to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Nixon expressed some sympathy for the Irish position on Northern Ireland. Nixon, betraying his 1952 sentiments, observed, and I quote, that the British had been somewhat negligent in the past on the issue of Northern Ireland, but the current British leadership was doing all that it could. That same year, Nixon told Hillary that in all of our high-level discussions with the British, our views on Northern Ireland are expressed. For instance, Nixon did, did do this with Heath at Bermuda in December 1971. In January 1973, Rogers also discussed it with Hillary and Lord Cromer, the British ambassador to the United States. Rogers expressed deep concern and stated that should, and I quote, the party's concern feel it is, it is possible for us to play a useful role, then we could naturally consider it. So the Nixon administration stance then had evolved on Northern Ireland to a willingness to become involved if, if invited to do so. But there were still some people in the administration who opposed this. For example, in March 1972, the British gov government um, had transferred um, security back to Westminster. That summer, there was some discussion at Nixon's request within the National Security Council 
about whether the United States could and should intervene in Northern Ireland. There's lots of back and forth discussion and ultimately Alexander Haig's intervention in the discussion was pure politicking. And this I quote, Haig, Haig, Haig said to the National Security Council, I can conceive of no more self-defeating initiative than to move one inch beyond our current policy. Thus far, we've avoided a hornet's nest by confining ourselves to saying that we are concerned about the Ulster tragedy, welcome all responsible efforts to stop the violence, and will consider playing a useful role, if asked, at the same time emphasising that it would be inappropriate and counterproductive to intervene in any way. According to Haig, Nixon already enjoyed Catholic support for his policies on busing, abortion and parochial schools. And Haig said this this, um, compensated for what he called a lack of do-goodism on the Ulster problem. So without electoral benefit and an inevitable foreign policy failure, intervention represented a no-win scenario for Nixon. This electioneering dimension was not lost on the president. In a handwritten note, he told Edward Heath, the British Prime Minister, and I quote, you can be sure that despite, despite the pressure of a political campaign, I shall not add to your problems on this issue. Nixon certainly possessed the interest and the nous, the political nous, and the ability to successfully engage with Northern Ireland. But if the British and Irish recognised the power of the US President and his potential influence on the issue, Aware of this, Nixon acted as an, as an informal intermediary, encouraging a solution. In an, in an attempt to demonstrate his peacemaking credentials, Nixon considered intervention, but was, was persuaded otherwise, as there was no opportunity for a successful one. Northern Ireland simply lacked the global significance for Nixon to override his advisers in this case. Ultimately, of course, as we know, the events of Watergate propelled Nixon's career in an unforeseen direction and prompted the advent of President Gerald Ford. Ford lacked any interest in Northern Ireland and followed Kissinger's advice to remain neutral. However, in an acknowledgement of the role of American citizens in gun running and financial support for violence in Northern Ireland, Ford agreed to Liam Cosgrove's, the, then the Taoiseach, his request to issue a communique opposing this when they met on St. Patrick's Day in 1976. But this communique received very little attention. But it was clear that although the United States government did not want to intervene, it could not ignore that some Americans were involved in the Troubles. As a presidential candidate, Jimmy Carter cast the British as the villain of the peace. He walked down Fifth Avenue in New York City on St. Patrick's Day in 1976 wearing a lapel badge bearing the slogan, Get Britain Out of Ireland. Carter's presidency coincided with the emergence of the Four Horsemen in Irish-American affairs. They were all Democrats, so Speaker Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, Senators Edward Kennedy and Daniel P. Moynihan, and Governor Hugh Carey of New York. Under the guidance of civil rights activist John Hume in Northern Ireland, the horsemen promoted a political solution in Northern Ireland and opposed Irish-American support for violence. The 1976 Democratic Party platform included a passage on Ireland, which called for an acknowledgement of American interest in Northern Ireland. At the drafting subcommittee, there was an attempt to insert, and I quote, the United States should work for a united Ireland, um, but this was rejected. The British Embassy and the Foreign Office understood that Carter's representatives were involved in its drafting and he approved of the platform. The British viewed this attempt as an unwelcome attempt to internationalise the Northern Ireland situation. During the election, Jimmy Carter deliberately courted the Irish-American vote. On the 10th of August 1976, he wrote a letter to John Michael Keane, who was the national president of the ancient order of Hibernians, an Irish-American group. Carter praised the contribution of Irish Americans to the American saga. He then explained that he had ordered the inclusion of Northern Ireland in his, into his party's platform as he was, and I quote, sympathetic with those who seek to promote a stable and free Ireland with full civil and human rights for all the citizens. The hope, if not expectation, that Carter would act on Irish American concerns culminated in his first presidential debate with Ford in October 1976 
When Carter failed to mention Northern Ireland during these debates, the Hibernians responded angrily and reminded him, just a small mention of a unified Ireland would bring many, many votes into your camp. Uh, the, the Hibernians understood from Carter's campaign that he would speak on the Irish question, and Carter did just that. On the 27th of October, 1976, Carter met with over 50 members of the Irish National Caucus in Pittsburgh, the INC. They were a Republican sympathising organisation. They were IRA sympathisers. He discussed civil rights in Northern Ireland, advocated in the United Ireland, and promised that as president, he would support American aid to should Northern Ireland conflict come to an end. Unsurprisingly, the caucus endorsed his candidacy. Carter's comments surprised the Irish government. Irish officials in the United States believed that Carter wouldn't, would not adopt a position which appeared sympathetic to the IRA, as he appeared to understand the complexities of the situation. Carter's comments contradicted this intelligence. The Irish government noted that the meeting was, of course, heralded by IRA supporters as a triumph. Carter, realising what he had done, quickly wrote to Garrett Fitzgerald, the, then the Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs, in order to clarify his remarks, saying that he'd been misrepresented. Likewise, his campaign issued a statement, saying that Governor Carter has never advocated violence as part of the solution to the tragic problems of Northern Ireland. The Carter campaign also contacted the British Embassy in a panic. Jerry Doolittle, it's a great name, who served as the press advisor on, on the campaign, called the embassy in a nervous state. He told the embassy that even though there was no record of Carter's remarks at Pittsburgh, he stressed that Carter did not support the IRA. Obviously, Carter went on to become president, and in March 1977, Northern Ireland was discussed between David Owens, the UK Foreign Secretary, and Cyrus Vance, the US Secretary of State, and also between James, Call James Callaghan, the British Prime Minister, and members of the US Congress. However, it was not discussed during Callaghan's meeting with President Carter. But a few days later, an Irish delegation did visit the Washington DC, and Carter met with Fitzgerald, the Foreign Minister. In this meeting, Northern Ireland was discussed, although it was out of Carter's interest and didn't really discuss any intervention. Prior to Carter's meeting with the new US ambassador to Ireland, William Shannon, in July 1977, his national security advisor advised him to emphasize a long-standing American policy of non-involvement in Northern Ireland, but reaffirmed support for a peaceful and just solution involving the two communities which protect human rights. In the meantime, the British and the Irish embassies were aware that Vance was working with the horsemen, um, was considering a presidential statement about Northern Ireland, the first of its kind, specifically some commitment to financial aid. The four horsemen had condemned Irish-American support for the IRA that year in their St. Patrick's statements, and they needed Carter for political cover. They worried that they would lose influence over Irish-American affairs and debate to Representative Maria Biaggi in New York who sympathised with the IRA and republicanism. At the end of August 1977, Carter did issue a statement in which he promised American investment if a power-sharing solution could be agreed. This was the first presidential statement that there will be American assistance should there be a solution in Northern Ireland. During Tip O'Neill's expedition to Europe in April 1979, there was speculation that Carter would attempt a Camp David summit for Northern Ireland, a bit like the 1978 Camp David Accords. Disappointed by comments about Northern Ireland in his meetings of Callaghan and Margaret Thatcher, O'Neill voiced his frustration at Dublin Castle in a speech when he was in Ireland. Appearing to speak on behalf of the US government, O'Neill commented, and I quote, we have been concerned that the problem has been treated like a, as a political football in London, or has otherwise been given a low priority. There was a great deal of criticism towards O'Neill from politicians and the press. The partisanship of what was happening in the UK general election was temporarily ended in a common rebuke towards a speaker for interfering in another country's domestic affairs. In a meeting with Lynch, again, who was again the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, O'Neill asked whether he had any message for the power of the American government. O'Neill was clearly offering to use his relationship with Carter. Lynch replied, and I quote, timing was essential or the whole issue could blow up in our faces. O'Neill also led a smaller delegation to Belfast and met leading Northern Ireland politicians at the residence of the US consulate. 
but the White House still dismissed any suggestion that O'Neill was acting on Carter's instruction. In fact, there is no evidence at all that O'Neill's 1979 visit to Ireland was the beginning of a Carter administration peace plan. Carter continued to cede Irish policy to his Democratic colleagues, namely the horsemen. However, O'Neill's influence was increasingly defined by his political battles with BRG. In January 1979, this battle was defined by the State Department's approval for American arms to be sold to the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the police force in Northern Ireland, and this needed a license. The RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, wanted to purchase 3,000 revolvers and 500 automatic rifles from Sturm, Ruger and Company of Southport, Connecticut. Some Irish Americans, such as Biagi, um, who incidentally was actually Italian, opposed the license amid condemnation of the British government following the publication of the Bennett Report in March 1979, which detailed the RUC's human rights abuses. Any license required congressional approval. O'Neill supported this ban on American weapon sales to the RUC. He hoped that it would prompt the British government to work towards a settlement in Northern Ireland. He also hoped to neutralise Biagi's argument that in selling arms to the RUC, the State, Dep the State Department was effectively taking sides in the Northern Ireland conflict. In short, neither the IRA nor the RUC would ever receive American support again. That caused some friction in Anglo-American relations, as Carter prioritised his domestic programme over his relationship with the new Thatcher government. At the White House in December 1979, Carter refused Thatcher's appeals to challenge Congress on the issue. He was firm in his advice that Thatcher should discuss the issue with O'Neill. Carter candidly admitted, admitted that he would have approved the sale, but he was unwilling to risk a defeat in Congress. While Thatcher was frustrated by Carter's stance, the President's approach to Northern Ireland impressed the Irish government, which applauded, he, applauded his impartiality and grasped for the complexities of the matter. On the eve of the 1980 presidential election, Carter issued another statement about Northern Ireland. In this, he claimed to have developed America's first comprehensive policy dealing with the issue, and he'd remained in close contact with the British and Irish governments to help promote an equitable settlement. Yet Carter's peacemaking was limited. He chose to use his diplomatic capital elsewhere and exaggerated his interest in Northern Ireland in order to raise expectations and political support. The extent of Ronald Reagan's interest in an understanding of the Troubles is unclear. Reagan refused T. Shock Fitzgerald's request to intervene in the 1981 hunger strike. At the same time, he displayed a simplistic understanding about the Troubles, asking Sean Donlon, the Irish ambassador to the United States, why the churches could not lead a peaceful resolution. In December 1981, William P. Clark, then Deputy Secretary of State and, of course, a close associate of Reagan, he alarmed the British government by claiming that the American people wanted to see a united Ireland. Clark also further confused the Irish government by informing Donlon of Reagan's commitment to achieving a settlement in Northern Ireland. As discussed what follows, what follows now, Reagan did see himself as a peacemaker in Northern Ireland. And this all followed Margaret Thatcher's emphatic rejection of the New Ireland Forum in 1984, which saw the Irish government and, the Ir and Irish Americans decide to play the Reagan card. This forum was the work of constitutional nationalist parties in Northern Ireland, and it recommended three possible solutions as a starting point for a settlement. They recommended a, uni a, uni a unified Ireland, a confederation of two states, or joint authority over Northern Ireland, between Ireland and Britain. Thatcher refused emphatically all three options with her infamous out-out-out response at the 1984 Anglo-Irish Summit. Subsequently, the Irish government asked Reagan to encourage Thatcher to work constructively with them on Northern Ireland. O'Neill also wrote to Reagan expressing his deep concern about Thatcher's attitude. He asked that he encourage her to renew dialogue over the forum report and recognise the report's significant support in Congress. Biagi also wrote to Reagan, urging him to practice, and I quote, some quiet diplomacy. So the Reagan administration revised its settled position neutrality on Northern Ireland. The president was briefed 
was briefed by the Secretary of State to, to discuss Northern Ireland with Thatcher at Camp David in December 1984. Secretary um, Schultz, he advised Reagan to urge Thatcher to achieve some progress at the next Anglo-Irish summit so as to prevent, and I quote, a radicalisation of Irish-American opinion which would endanger our current bipartisan policy towards Northern Ireland. But the, despite the briefings, it was Margaret Thatcher who raised the issue in an act of political preemption. The American record re reads, and I quote, Mrs. Thatcher said that she wished to address the situation in Northern Ireland. Despite reports to the contrary, she and Garrett Fitzgerald, the Taoiseach, were on good terms and we were working towards making progress on this difficult question. Reagan replied, the President said making progress is important and, and observed that there is great congressional interest in this matter. Indeed, Tip O'Neill had sent him a personal letter asking him to appeal to Mrs. Thatcher for a reasonable forthcoming to be reasonable and forthcoming. And at that point, you can imagine Reagan produced a letter to show Margaret Thatcher. Reagan subsequently wrote to O'Neill, and of course, he overstated his, the extent of his comments to Thatcher. Reagan told O'Neill, and I quote, I made a special effort to bring your letter to her personal attention and to convey your message of concern. I also personally emphasised the need for progress in resolving the complex situation in Northern Ireland and the, the desirability for flexibility in the part of all the involved parties. Now, this common belief that Reagan really put pressure on Thatcher um, is summed up in Fitzgerald's memoir, where he praises Reagan for contributing to the more positive approach the British adopted. But the following year did see progress in Northern Ireland. The Anglo-Irish Agreement was signed on the 15th of November 1985. In short, the Irish government would now be consulted over the affairs of Northern Ireland. Private emissaries from the British and the Irish governments met with the Reagan administration to ask for Reagan support for the agreement and guarantee of American financial investment in Northern Ireland as per Carter's statement in 1977. There was a domestic interest of Reagan O'Neill was impressed by his willingness to address Northern Ireland on the night before his first meeting with Gorbachev in Geneva. Reagan diarised, and I quote, at 9am Washington time, Prime Ministers Thatcher and Fitzgerald signed an agreement on bringing peace to Northern Ireland. Tip O'Neill came down and we were photographed together endorsing their action and making statements of support. Now, Reagan either failed to fully understand the continuing challenges in Northern Ireland, or characteristically, his view of the agreement was shaped by his sunny optimism. The Reagan administration then wanted the aid programme to further their broader policy agenda. Ted Kennedy, um, in an interview with the Miller Centre, he recalled that Reagan offered $50 million over just five years, although in the spirit of the 1980s, most of this would all be incentivised for the private sector to come in. When Kennedy asked O'Neill about, uh, and when Kennedy and O'Neill asked Donald T. Regan, who was then the White House Chief of Staff, about direct aid, Regan indicated that he was prepared to get us the money if we were prepared to call off the dogs of the Boland Amendment, which was to end the war with the Contras in Nicaragua. It was sort of a pre pro quo, and we weren't going to have that. So the Reagan administration trying to use the Irish money to get their way with the Nicaraguan Contras. <coughs> American aid to Northern Ireland, though, was O'Neill's final flourish before retirement in 1987. The House representatives unanimously voted in March 1986 for £250 million in, aid, in an aid package over five years to Northern Ireland, so a lot more than the initial £50 million that Reagan initially offered. Reagan then certainly used the diplomatic means necessary to seize the initiative in Northern Ireland. Reagan broke from precedent and discussed the importance of positive action with Thatcher, although she raised it. However, it was for his own purposes, namely using it unsuccessfully as a means to gain Tip O'Neill's support for other policies. <coughs> O'Neill, of course, was a Speaker of the House of Representatives, and O'Neill needed the Congress on side. So Reagan needed the Congress on side. Reagan certainly matched expectations with the Irish Anglo-Irish agreement, but the agreement itself was a step towards a peace process rather than a peace process in itself. The ending of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union guaranteed that President George H. Bush was not interested in Northern Ireland. However, key developments meant that the foundations of the peace process were secured before Bush handed over the White House to President Bill Clinton in 1993. 
For instance, the American Consul General in Belfast improved its contacts across Northern Ireland. Therefore, the State Department was unsurprised by secret talks between Gerry Adams and John Hume in 1988, which established common ground for nationalists and Republicans. Also significant were talks arranged by Peter Brook, the British Northern Ireland Secretary, who brought together all interested parties in Northern Ireland. And it was these talks about talks that led to a temporary ceasefire in 1991. So finally then, let's look at Bill Clinton. Well, the Good Friday Agreement on the 10th of April, and on the 10th of April 1998 was a major milestone in the Northern Ireland peace process. We all know this. It established agreements on devolution to Northern Ireland, uh, new cross-border institutions, and in civil rights and decommissioning. It was a success in Bill Clinton's foreign policy. Clinton's rhetoric about Northern Ireland compared the conflict to situations in Bosnia, the Middle East, and Haiti, which required his peacemaking initiatives. His engagement with the Troubles therefore represented a new broader mission in American foreign policy after the Cold War. However, Clinton, Clinton does not deserve all the credit for the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. The advent of the Clinton administration coincided with a willingness by unionists and nationalists to work together. Moreover, the Republican movement acknowledged that the war between the IRA and the British government, government was at a stalemate, and the armed struggle of the IRA was only resulting in negative electoral consequences for Sinn Féin. Clinton's interest in Northern Ireland was obvious during his 1992 presidential campaign. He addressed an Irish-American political meeting in New York, promising that as president he would dispatch a special envoy to Northern Ireland and grant Gerry Adams, the Sinn Féin leader, a visa to enter the United States. Anthony Lake, who was then the campaign's foreign policy advisor and Clinton's subsequent national security advisor, was critical of this strategy. He recalled in an interview that, the, that he viewed this policy as inflammatory and ill-advised. Clinton's remarks were well received by Irish American groups, but they worried British diplomats. Clinton's interest in Northern Ireland was a result of a combination of factors. Campaign promises, a long-standing personal interest from when he was at Oxford as a student, Irish Americans lobbying, including senior Democrats, and a peacemaking foreign policy agenda, and really the importance of political victories. Clinton's interest was summarized by Ted Kennedy in an interview, and I quote, I think he wasn't having a lot of successes in a lot of different places. And this was a process that was going through and that looked like he had some real prospect of making it. However, Clinton's involvement was significant. Sean Donlon, who was still involved in Irish politics in the early 90s, he told me in an interview that it was impossible to exaggerate Clinton's importance to the peace process. According to Donlon, um, Clinton was better briefed for Northern Ireland than senior members of the Irish government. Initially, the Irish government stalled Clinton's enthusiasm. In March 1993, Clinton met Albert Reynolds, who was then the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach. Reynolds convinced Clinton to postpone the envoy because an American envoy would be viewed as pro-nationalist and cause difficulties for John Major, the British Prime Minister. Reynolds' political efforts with Major culminated in the 1993 Downing Street Declaration. Crucially, this established that the British government would act as a facilitator for an agreed island, not a united island, unless there was ever a majority consent in Northern Ireland for this. In return, the Irish government called for the IRA to decommission its arms. Now that the British and the Irish governments were in agreement, the United States government need not worry about choosing sides between friends. The only role they could play would be a supporting one in the peace process. Clinton at the time described this declaration as an historic opportunity. That same year, Clinton appointed Jean Kennedy Smith as the American ambassador to Ireland. Such a romantic appointment was illustrative of Clinton's political savviness to please Democrats, especially Ted Kennedy, and assure Irish Americans of his commitment to Northern Ireland. In January 1994, Clinton went further. He granted Gerry Adams a visa to enter the United States. Given Sinn Féin's ties to the IRA and the inevitable British concerns, there was much debate about this within the Clinton administration. Nancy Soderberg, who was a member of the national security team, her account of the British and the US State Department's reactions is quite colorful. She said, and I quote, the entire State Department just had a fit, as, as did the entire British Empire, and they were so angry 
that about it, they were just really weren't capable of coordinating anything anymore. So according to Soderberg, the British just went nuts, went completely crazy, they just collapsed. Adams's, Adams, Adams's visa also meant that John Major refused to take Bill Clinton's calls for days. Can you imagine a British Prime Minister not taking the calls of the American President? Um, it's quite extraordinary. But the visa underlined the American realisation that, that a process that exclusively was between the British and the Irish governments would not end the conflict. A peace process needed the nationalist and the unionist parties. It even needed Gerry Adams and, the, and Sinn Féin. Soderbergh recalled, and I quote, I asked Gerry Adams once whether if Clinton had been president in the early, early mid-1980s, if he could have made a difference. He said, no, we weren't ready. I think that's probably right. Adams in an interview recalled that his visa was symbolically very big because the US foreign policy up until that point under previous presidents had been broadly speaking in, favor, in support of the British position. So the Clinton administration then was willing to unsettle the British government as taking a risk for, for peace in Northern Ireland was not a political gamble for the president, in contrast where it was to the British and the Irish governments. However, seizing this initiative was helpful for Clinton at home. A White House staffer remarked that the visa would be a boon to Clinton's domestic politics and the peace process. Um, so therefore, it was, it was acceptable for him to annoy the British. Senators Moynihan and Kennedy, they, have, they were key chairmen of Senate committees. And these committees were very important to Clinton's health care and welfare proposals, who needs to get their support. Subsequently, um, the IRA announced a ceasefire on the 31st of August 1994, and in November 1995, Bill Clinton became the first American president to visit Northern Ireland. Clinton urged unionists and the British government to maintain dialogue while calling on Republicans to maintain the ceasefire. Despite progress, decommissioning was a roadblock. John Major refused to participate in any peace talks that included Sinn Féin until the IRA decommissioned its arms. But the British agreed to an independent group, the International Body on Arms Decommissioning, to review the process, which would be led by US Senator George Mitchell. In January 1996, Mitchell advised that decommissioning should not have to take place before Sinn Féin was admitted, to, admitted to, the, to the peace talks. Instead, he said that all paramilitary groups were decommissioned during the talks. However, the peace process suddenly stalled on the 9th of February 1996 when the IRA broke the ceasefire with a bomb at Canary Wharf in London. The White House was stunned, but Clinton maintained contact with Adams in anticipation that an opportunity would soon emerge for peace talks to continue. When Tony Blair became British Prime Minister in May 1997, the Troubles had caused over 3,000 fatalities in 35 years. He informed Clinton that Northern Ireland would be a top priority. Fifteen days after arriving in Downing Street, Blair visited Northern Ireland, surprising Clinton at how quickly he actually went. He directly addressed Sinn Féin, and I quote, The settlement train is leaving. I want you on that train, but it is leaving anyway, or will not allow it to wait for you. Northern Ireland was discussed when Clinton visited Blair in London later that month. Clinton told Blair, I have some pull and can call in chits, which must be an Arkansas term for favour. The presidents observed, one problem is that the people are further along than the leaders. For people like Sinn Féin and Ian Paisley, the conflict is their whole life. In other words, again, quote, Quoting Clinton, if there were no political leaders, we would get the people to agree. The United States continued to pressure the IRA for another ceasefire. On the 3rd of June 1997, Mitchell resumed his negotiations after Clinton stated that Sinn Féin should be readmitted if the IRA delivered a ceasefire. Blair hoped to convince the IRA to do this by criminalising two unionist parallel military groups, and he abandoned John Major's position that they announced a timetable for decommissioning. Um, before participating in talks. This strategy was successful. The RA ceasefire recommenced on the 19th of July 1997 and Sinn Féin agreed to adopt the Mitchell Principles, meaning the commitment to the principles of democracy and non-violence. Blair announced that negotiations would cease on the 1st of May 1998. This, this was important because it addressed any Sinn Féin claims that unionists would simply slow the progress and the talks amount to nothing. Clinton's engagement with all sides continued. He told Blair in February 1998, and I quote, we will continue our contacts and dialogue with Sinn Féin. 
I also intend to keep seeing Trimble and other key unionist leaders when they come to town. In fact, the White House St. Patrick's Day party became quite the gathering for Irish and Northern Irish leaders. Um, that, that often, I think, Jerry Adams and the unionist leaders started like, singing songs together at, at one point, it's all bringing them all together. All these talks culminated with the Good Friday Agreement in April 1998. In some, it meant that there would be power sharing in Northern Ireland between unionists and nationalists and cooperation with the Irish government on any cross-border issues. Nationalists accepted Northern Ireland's legitimacy and the principle of majority consent. Sinn Féin was shown to have a role in Northern Ireland's future. Clinton observed that it was a fine piece of work, calling for majority rule and minority rights. Blair gave much credit to Clinton's role in the peace process, particularly in the final hours of the talks. He recalls, and I quote, that he was a total brick throughout, tracking the, ne the negotiation, staying up all night, calling anyone he needed to call, saying anything that, needed, that he needed to say, and much more besides. So just to conclude then, as I come to the end of my, my time, Much like Nixon, Carter and Reagan, Bill Clinton was a conduit between Northern Ireland stakeholders and like them, he was prepared to help if invited to do so. However, unlike his predecessors, Clinton could become directly involved in the peace process. The end of the Cold War and the Downing Street Declaration ensured that Clinton did not have to choose sides. Importantly, Clinton had a mastery of the issues. He was the right person at the right time. Clinton's legacy as a peacemaker in Northern Ireland is indicative of the importance of individuals in history. Nonetheless, broader structures and phenomena were just as important. In the post-Cold War era, internal national and ethnic conflicts were internationalised. The peace process happened because the Northern Ireland parties wanted it to happen. The United States' position was consistent throughout the Troubles. It was willing to assist if asked to do so and if it could be helpful. Clinton was invited by all, by all participants to do just that. Clinton helped because he was asked to help and was able to help. And on that note, just I just need to thank you for coming and thank the Nobel Peace Institute for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here, so thank you very much. Yeah. Much about uh, the, the efforts of various American presidents towards Northern Irish, uh, the resolution of the conflict in Northern Ireland, and uh, as it comes across, it's not uh, a matter of priority for, mm -hmm. for American presidents. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Clinton comes along and uh, building on the work of John Major, then uh, Bla Blair, Blair jumps into this. Mm -hmm. What I've been missing in, your, in your, uh, your talk is you kind of allude to that what brought this whole thing about was basically just a change of circumstance. Uh, could you please elaborate to us specifically what was it about the end of the Cold War uh, that represented such a change of circumstances? Because surely Ireland is nowhere near uh, a, a battle <laughs> battleground for the, during the Cold War. Thank you. Okay. Well, also what happened at the end of the, the Cold War is that the American government, government didn't have to worry about upsetting the British. I mean, the Britain was still very, it was, it was a special relationship, Anglo-American relations, uh, still very useful um, for America during the Cold War. Um, so with the end of the Cold War, you didn't need that, that alliance, you didn't need that, Britain was so important for the Western alliance for America, um, that without the Cold War happening, um, they didn't need them as much. Basically, American interests changed. I mean, like, it's a bit like the special relationship more generally. I'd argue the Anglo-American special relationship is driven by interests, um, you know, like all relationships, you could argue. And after the Cold War, American interests changed. Um, America was very concerned with, say, unified Germany, um, you know, George Bush's New World Order, and um, without the, the Cold War and the fear of you know, nuclear annihilation and trying to do deals with the Soviet Union, other conflicts became a priority. Um, around more ethnic-based conflicts became a priority. So that's where American interests turned. Um, so if it's just a combination, not having to worry about damaging that relationship with Britain, um, and just the change in nature of, of the world circumstances um, and, and American priorities. And also Bill Clinton had, had a personal interest, of course, in, in Northern Ireland, going back to when he was a student in Oxford. 
Um, so I think it's just the, the combination of all those different circumstances. Uh, if, I, yeah. if I may, yeah. uh, then what was it that brought about what seems to be to be the main shift, and that is the IRA giving up on its main demand mm -hmm. uh, that Ireland be reunited and that the mm -hmm. British pull out of Northern mm -hmm. Ireland? What brought that about, the Americans? Mm -hmm. Now, if it was the, the IRA themselves, have they realised that they weren't going to win, that this had been gone on for 30 years, and it was just, you know, more, more killings, more deaths, more, more, more destruction, uh, more terrorism, and it had got nowhere. And there had been secret discussions between the, the IRA and the British, and um, this wasn't an uncommon thing. Um, so, I think it was just a change in tactics, really. They realised they'd reached a stalemate, um, that they weren't going to win. I, I got the microphone. Is it okay that I speak? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My name is Henrik Sus. So thank you very much for uh, an interesting uh, lecture and uh, many uh, important observations. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the Catholic Church uh, mm -hmm. in the United States. There is a sizable number of Catholics in the United States, and having lived myself for a few years in Boston, I was uh, quite impressed by the way in which that colors the uh, political discourse there, including on, on Ireland. I, I lived there from 89 to 91. So it would be interesting to hear your reflections on that vis-a-vis -vis the American presence. Thank you very much. It's okay. quite a big question. Um, do you mean in relation to Northern Ireland or just, yeah, Northern Ireland? Um, well, obviously, you had some involvement of some of priests involved in the Irish National Caucus. She had some former, I think came in from Ireland, a chap called Father McManus. Um, he was involved in the Irish National Caucus quite heavily. Um, so, but in terms of the, the Catholic Church generally, um, Ronald Reagan um, would often say just thought that the church should just get together and solve the whole issue, which kind of betrayed a bit of naivety about the whole, about the whole thing, you could argue. Um, but in terms of the Catholic Church, and what, what it did in terms of influencing um, the American president about this, I haven't really came across any evidence of the president's talking to the talking to the churches and this is this kind of thing which may have happened kind of off the record or you're not going to have maybe a sit down formal meeting of note takers with you know the, the, the New York City Bishop or Archbishop of New York or something like that um, but so I, I've not really came across any evidence that in terms of the Catholic Church it was more probably a Cold War story because we got John Paul II um, Poland and you know, solidarity and all that, and, and, and all of that so Reagan had a sympathy with, with John Paul II for the bigger picture. But in terms of the, the Catholic Church, in all of my going through all the documents to with Ireland, um, the IRA in Northern Ireland, with all the presidential libraries, uh, I've not came across any meetings or discussions with the Catholic Church. Because obviously, well, I'm sure the Catholic Church being, being good Christian folk, they would have condemned all the violence and, uh, in their sermons regularly. Thanks for the uh, very interesting uh, discussion and uh, many layered uh, discussion about this. I uh, wanted to return to Osley's point just a little bit uh, again, and that is that at the moment where uh, Clinton intervenes, uh, you tell us that there is a, a, an environment in Ireland at that point that mm -hmm. is really receptive to this. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could expand on that some more, you know, because I, I'm, I'm thinking that the conflict in Northern Ireland and the Irish conflict in general it's more than just the 30 years, it's 700 years. Mm -hmm. And after that length of time, suddenly these sides are ready to talk. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really remarkable, I think. Yeah, I think it's probably a common together of different personalities. Um, so you had John Hume, of course, is a big, big um, civil rights activist um, in Northern Ireland. Um, he's, of course, leader of the SDLP, so then the Nationalist Party. And of course, in the late 1980s, early 90s, he got together with um, Jerry Adams, and they were finding common ground between the Nationalist and the Republican, Republican causes. Um, so that they could agree and talk to each other kind of brings that side of the debate um, closer together. Um, and it's, I think it's just the, the key thing was that the, the British and the Irish governments finally agreed on a, on a policy. Um, the fact that they agreed that there needs to be an agreed island. And so there was an acceptance that actually Northern Ireland probably was going to stay in the 
in the United Kingdom, as long as the majority wanted that to happen. Um, but they agreed that they had to agree on how, how things went forward in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, I think it just, just, just comes with different personalities. Um, the fate had 30 years of violence. People grew tired of it. Um, there's you know, the generational shift. Um, so on the one hand, as Clinton said, you had the likes of Paisley and Adams that the conflict was their entire life. Then you had other younger people below them who didn't want to grow up in a society um, like that. So, yeah, that's what... Thank you, James, for a very interesting talk. Good overview of, of this history. Um, Osler asked you uh, what was it that changed so fundamentally with the end of the Cold War that uh, laid the ground for more American involvement. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to follow up on that, but perhaps turn the question upside down. Uh, I would like you to explain to us why American presidents during the Cold War period should be interested and involve themselves mm -hmm. in peacemaking in Northern Ireland. I mean, mm -hmm. it, the Ireland conflict was not part, there was hardly any Cold War dimension to the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and unless Britain strongly invited and encouraged mm -hmm. American involvement, I guess there would be very good reasons for American presidents mm -hmm. to not involve mm -hmm. themselves. So if you perhaps could say a few words about mm -hmm. that. Uh, and um, secondly, about Clinton's uh, involvement, um, and you are talking in this room, uh, I think it's natural to ask you whether you think there should have been three people receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 1998. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Carter and Camp David, and uh, there was, of course, a strong feeling in many places after that, that Carter was missing, that he should have received, been part of that uh, award uh, for the Camp David Agreement. And as you also mentioned, eventually he did receive a peace prize. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is simply, do you think personally that uh, Clinton's involvement was so important that uh, there was a kind of sin of omission by the, um, committed not to uh, award him as well. Thank okay, thank you. Well, I wouldn't want to second guess the decisions of the Nobel Prize Committee. <laughs> uh, that would uh, be quite very brave and bold of me. Um, perhaps, perhaps, you know, this is a big, perhaps the Clinton was so sim symptomatic of the, of the whole process coming together. Um, you know, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to second guess the Nobel Prize awarding criteria. It's, uh, um, in terms of why American presidents should they have cared? Well, the reason why they, they, people try to get them to care is probably driven by various factors, mainly domestic factors. Um, and there's this belief that if you can get the American president to care about something, that it the, legitimizes the issue. If, it's in the, if it makes the Oval Office, then it's a real deal. It's, a, it's an issue. And the American president will give the, his or, or her attention. Um, so people like Carter, um, to an extent Nixon, um, they spoke about this and they mentioned this, they asked about it because of domestic factors. So you've got Irish Americans in Congress who are very powerful. So people like Tip O'Neill cares about this issue. He's Speaker of the House of Representatives. Ted Kennedy cares about this issue, senior senator. Um, Governor of New York, a big, a big state, a big deal. Um, so I think the American presidents during the Cold War, um, not necessarily maybe why they should care about it, but maybe flip it again and say why people wanted them to care about it or thought they should care about it. Um, and again, you can even be even more cynical of why did um, Mario Biagi in New York write to Ronald Reagan and, and Jimmy Carter to care about this issue? Or well, because he's a congressman from New York City, big Irish population. So you can actually argue there's lots of um, domestic politics driving all of this. Um, so in terms of why should they have cared during the Cold War? Because there's a view that there were some votes in it and that other people who mattered in the Congress cared about it, you could argue maybe you have a genuine humanitarian concern or because there were votes in it. That's been my very cynical hat on. Okay, thanks.
Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. You stick very closely to your mandate or to your title because you focus rather exclusively on the U.S. president. But I think in part you miss some of the wider context. You don't get a full understanding of the importance of the Irish issue in American politics. I mean, they were numerous, they were well organized, and they were uh, very loud. Um, and of course, there is the reference to the four horsemen, but uh, Irish politics um, uh, was quite important in US politics. And, and I don't think we really get a, a feeling for this when you focus so exclusively uh, on the president. I mean, we see the Nixon's brief interest for electoral reasons. Uh, we see Carter's brief interest. Um, but uh, I, I think we miss some of the importance of this issue by the uh, very explicit focus on the president rather exclusively. And I wonder if you overstate uh, the extent to which uh, the issue of money from America and guns from America had been solved. I mean, you say explicitly that this was a dead issue. I'm not so sure it was a dead issue. At least not all the parties consider this a dead issue. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we, we want explanations for uh, why the story ended up in the way it did. And you refer uh, on the final page to these uh, structural factors. Uh, but they aren't really uh, discussed. I want to just very briefly add one dimension because um, we did, after all, the Nobel Committee did give the prize to Human Trimble in 1998. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was very obvious that the two gentlemen felt that uh, um, um, something had to be done. And they also analyzed this in tactical terms, because they felt that as long as the focus was on the unresolved territorial nationalist issue, uh, there was the constant temptation that their two parties, somewhat in the center, would lose out. I mean, the extreme parties uh, would win elections, and they would always be handicapped because um, they, they were in the middle on the nationalist issue. It was kind of interesting, their, their clear expectation was that once this issue was resolved, their parties would prosper. They were wrong, of course. Mm -hmm. The territorial issue was resolved, and the extremes did rather well, continued to do rather well uh, in, uh, in Northern Irish uh, politics. Uh, but th there was a, the, the feeling was still there. It was very noticeable. But the other thing which I would say was very noticeable in 98 was that th there was a, a sense of <laughs> Irish community. I mean, th they could quarrel and discuss things as much as, as you would like, but once the day's work was over, they could, they could have endless parties. We lasted all night, and they were all of them celebrating, Catholics and Protestants and all this. And just as a little footnote, of course, Bill Clinton's contribution to this process was, of course, mentioned in the announcement made by the Nobel Committee. It was recognized explicitly by name uh, because, um, well, first of all, it was obvious uh, that Clinton um, had played a, a major role. So, but I think the main point, as several others have suggested, is that we, we, there, there could be a somewhat wider net and we, we, we wonder about the explanations. I mean, not only on the American side, but also on the Irish side and the English side. I mean, there were important developments there. I, I, uh, just one final note. Um, I met uh, Gerrit Fitzgerald when he was Prime Minister of Ireland uh, because he had a daughter in Tromsø where I was. And, uh, uh, as a professor, and he came, and we had an ample opportunity to talk with him. I mean, he, st he struck me as an eminently sensible man. I mean, you had this image of the Irish as hopelessly, I mean, rigid, but Fitzgerald, he was a very open-minded person. He, 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 um, 
he wanted to, to contribute to some sort of uh, solution was my clear impression. Of course, then they had some nasty guys in between, but uh, that's a different matter. Um, thank you. I, I agree with what you, everything you just said. Um, yeah, absolutely, the, the, the paper as it is, just focus on the US president, it's quite narrow. Um, hopefully, if you read my book, when it comes out next year, you'll see the broader picture of the, the, of the, of the Irish America story. Um, just try to, obviously, yeah, there were obviously a lot more factors, which I didn't allude to at the end. Um, just in terms of the, the guns, the gun running issue, um, I'm sorry, I'd, if I did give that impression, I said it was a dead in the water issue, it was just solved. Um, I, I apologize, I didn't mean to do that at all. Um, that was obviously an ongoing issue, even to the 19, into, into the 80s. It wasn't just when Gerald Ford stood up and said, don't do this anymore, guys, it didn't just stop. Uh, this obviously carried on. And the US um, Justice Department were investigating for a, a long time after that. Um, and in terms of the Irish-American politics, yeah, the Irish were, were, were yeah, they, they, you know, what, there's that book, Why Did the Irish Become White? Um, but it's because they took over the police department. You know, the Irish, you know, why, why was it so important for Jack Kennedy, to, for, for Joe Kennedy, for, for his son to become the president, so that the Irish would become accepted, Irish Catholics would be in mainstream society? So, of course, there, there is a bigger story in terms of Irish politics. Um, the Irish are very important for the Democratic Party in New, in New York, in Massachusetts, you know, they were the party bosses. Um, but also, this, this idea that we can't just say all the Irish are all, or agree, they all, f all think the same thing. I think what the Northern Ireland story shows is that there was actually divisions amongst Irish America. You had the likes of um, Tip O'Neill, who went from, in the 60s, he was, his view would have been, get the Brits out. And then thanks to the influence of John Hume, um, Tip O'Neill, like the other horsemen, they moved on to a position of, we want to have a political settlement, whatever that may, well, whatever that may be and just end the violence. They just stop the violence, stop American support for the violence as well. Excuse me. Um, but, so as well, but as well as having those more moderate elements, you could argue, in our shed, of course, Republican sympathizers. You had, if you go out to the bars of Boston, um, you had like Penny for the Lads, um, you know, for, you know, just the, the, the Jack Ryan movie, Patriot Games, when he goes into an Irish bar in America, um, you know, meets the, the hard-lined um, IRA sympathizers. Um, so the idea that all Irish agreed on how to do, sort this out. Obviously, very simplistic. Um, and the fact that this, this Irish politics, the debate amongst Irish Americans, goes to the heart of the Democratic Party. So, especially in the, in the Carter era, you end up with a situation where, um, for example, with the, the banning of sales, of, the, of arms sales, to the Royal Ulster Constabulary, O'Neill has to go along with Biaggi on this because O'Neill doesn't want to lose the control, if you like, of the Irish Americans in Congress to Biaggi, who of course is a firebrand Republican IRA sympathizer. Um, so he agrees with Biaggi that we need to stop weapon sale. Um, but there's also worries that Biaggi, who ended up actually being an advisor to the Carter campaign in 1980, that he was going to call in lots of IOUs to the Carter team. So there is almost a battle within the Democrats, or Irish American Democrats, for control of this agenda. Um, so it's quite, and that in turn then of course has an impact actually on, on the presidency of who's the president listening to, who will the president listen to in the future. Um, so, and also how Americans or American pollsters and politicians view the Irish evolved. So at the, at the start of the White well if we come out and say something nice about Northern Ireland, how you know, get, we need to have a, a peaceful solution there, uh, we will get votes get Irish-American votes, so actually realise that maybe Irish-Americans vote on other things, that they vote on schools, they vote on policing, they the vote with their pocketbooks, vote with their wallets. So um, there's the, I think there's an, an evolution of how politicians approach the Irish vote as the nuances of the Irish vote as well came out. Um, does that answer some of your, your questions there? Thanks for this really interesting discussion. Um, I have three questions, and um, the first one pertains to the statement of your main argument on the first page, when you're kind of generally talking about how if a president is going to be able to act as a peacemaker, 
he needs to be able to use both military and diplomatic means. And I'm just wondering if you could elaborate upon what you mean by military means. I I know you've spoken of this arms sales issue, but presumably there's a broader way to look at how you see military means in the creation of peace. Um, secondly, I'm wondering, in, in just listening to your story, um, if you could reflect on the counterfactual of if Clinton hadn't become more engaged, um, do you think the peace would have been achieved, the troubles would have ended? Um, and if so, I mean, I know counterfactual is kind of like you're guessing, but I'm just trying to get a sense of how important his role really was in your research. Um, and, and thirdly, I, I, I mean, I find that I'm swept away with your story as you're telling it, and it seems quite unproblematic. It seems like it makes perfect sense. So if you could tell us a little bit about what kind of conventional wisdom you are overturning in this research, in this project, um, what, what would be the main argument against your approach that you're basically um, disproving? And along with that, um, what do we learn ultimately from your survey of these presidents' roles about American presidents' diplomacy and sort of beyond just the kind of individuals matter in history? Um, what's, what's sort of the, the added value of this, this really in-depth research you've conducted on all these presidents and understanding how they operate? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, I'll do my best of each one in turn. Um, in terms of the military or diplomatic means to achieve peace. I don't, how do you do, sort of very broadly define, but it also could be the threat of military action. Um, so you could go down the, the, the peace through strength idea. Uh, so you know, the Re Reagan's argument that we need to have all these nuclear weapons um, so we never have to use them. Um, so that kind of the, the idea that America is so strong and so powerful that um, if the diplomatic means fail, then there's the other means as well. So, you know, perhaps the, the, the big stick and the carrot uh, is what I was referring to. In terms of the counterfactual, um, if there's no Clinton, was there no peace? I think, as Soderbergh said, when she was chatting to, you know, remember what Jerry Adams said, how Jerry Adams said that if Clinton had been around in the mid 80s, um, it wouldn't have made any difference because they weren't ready. So, I think he needs lots of these facts to all come together. Um, so, yes, you had, so in the mid 90s, Late 90s, they were ready. Um, if there hadn't been Clinton, if, if Bill Clinton, if there had been no Bill Clinton, if you'd had, if you had Bob Dole, um, 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 would there still be a peace? Um, if Clinton wasn't, been, well, I think whoever been the American president, you never, obviously, you never know. Um, that's counterfactual. My guess is whoever been the American president, given the fact that for as I've shown for 30 odd years, um, there've been there'd been Irish-American pressure to get involved, that the Irish government wanted them to be involved. And at this point, the Brits were happy for them to be involved. <coughs> Bob, Senate, President Dole, I think, would have still got involved. Um, and then, of course, having the, because it was a winner. It was like Ted Kennedy said, it was a win. Um, it was like an open goal, uh, really, that if the president got involved and just kicks over the finishing line, kicks him over the touchline, it would, it would have been fine. So I think if there'd been no Clinton, an American president, I think, would have still helped get it done such a clear victory. It was such a good chance for a Nobel Prize that you, why, why could you, what you not do? Um, so, and if, if Clinton, and I don't think Clinton would have resisted it because Clinton was such a political animal and loved doing deals and loved people, talking to people, that, so I don't mean to reject the premise of the question, but I think Bill, there's no way that Bill Clinton was not going to get involved in this. Um, if, however, it looked like it was going to, there was no hope that the developments of, um, of the early 90s hadn't happened, would Clinton have got as involved as he had? Would he have gone beyond what other presidents had done? I don't know, because would Clinton would Clinton look for his victories elsewhere? Um, in terms of what am I, what am I proving? What's, what, what is my contribution to knowledge, to use, your, use the, perhaps the, the PhD lingo? What do, what do we learn? Well, the whole book, the project itself, is look at the nature of um, US, the US presidents. And of course, there is the argument there is two, we'll go through, I'll go through the list. There's the argument there's two presidencies. There's the domestic and there's the foreign. Well, part of my argument is that there's actually a third presidency. There's the electioneering president, there's a the campaigning president, there's a the vote catching president. And this is one of the issues which they use to, to do those things. Um, 
And there's also just the argument that in the historiography, there is little historiography about this, or the popular memory, or the scholastic work, or higher journalism, if you will. They all say, oh, it was just Bill Clinton. And before Clinton, no American president would touch this. When actually, I think what my, the wider project shows is that presidents did touch this, presidents did speak out um, to varying degrees, which they thought that would be successful. And they were, did that for the electioneering reasons, um, and thought that maybe it could have been a win. Um, so I hope that answers your, your question. Uh, <coughs> well, we have one question here. Um, yes, I just wanted to thank you for the very interesting lecture. Um, it's not often that this uh, topic is discussed, at least not in uh, my social circle. And um, uh, I just wanted to ask if, uh, in your opinion, uh, the kind of mission of uh, the peacemaking in Northern Ireland, um, how it would have differed from uh, how history went uh, if uh, America had not intervened, because it seems like uh, both Ireland and, uh, and England uh, kind of depended and relied on uh, America's intervention uh, in this conflict. And um, just uh, in your opinion, do you think they could have uh, made a peace treaty or something uh, mm -hmm. on their own, or would it have been delayed, or would it have been made faster if uh, they wouldn't have had America as a third kind of companion <laughs> conflict? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Again, we, again, it's counterfactual. We don't really know for sure. Um, I think you need to, to answer that question is to look at the reasons why it mattered that an American president cared. And it matters because both countries probably instinctively are Atlanticist. Um, um, Ameri Britain, of course, has a... You could argue they both have kind of special relationship with America, if you want to use that language. Um, Britain, of course, has more of a political relationship and a strategic and a military relationship, um, whilst Ireland has more of an emotional relationship. But either way, they're both Atlanticists, they're both Atlantic looking. So the fact that the American president cared um, showed that it was a serious, serious thing. Plus, you can also look at the personalities involved that ultimately British politicians, I'm sure, when they get to go to the White House, they're very excited. If they get a phone call for or a tweet from the American president, um, it's very glamorous for them. Um, any West Wing fans here, I'm sure that David Cameron and his co used to maybe in, on the, in, the, in the motorcade would think, oh, let's go and play the West Wing. And, I'll be Toby and you be Josh, um, or I'll be Bartlett. Um, so I think the fact that the American president has such a big presence, it's so glamorous and so, so, so powerful is good. Um, there's a great story in Alistair Campbell's diary where um, during part of the, the, some, some talks just after the Good Friday Agreement, and um, this looks like it's stalling, and um, they're all sitting around with, with Trimble, and um, the phone goes, and Trimble's being quite intransigent about something. And he uh, picks up the phone and uh, he, and, he, and he hear it, he hear it, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. He puts the phone away and said, it's President Clinton. Like, it's kind of like, oh, God. And, he, then, the, and then it all gets sorted. Um, so, and the fact that during the, the closing hours of all of the, of the talks, the Good Friday Agreement, Clinton was phoning everyone and doing deals and, and the fact that this mattered, um, I think it shows how important the president was. If there wasn't... If the, the American president hadn't got involved, I, don't, I can't imagine somewhere where there would be no presidential involvement. Um, but sometimes you need a third party to get involved. So if it hadn't been Clinton, would somebody else have stepped? Would it, you know, if it hadn't been the president, would someone else have stepped in for the glory? Um, you know, I suppose in a family dispute, sometimes you need a third party, don't you, to go and mediate. So perhaps someone else would have stepped in. Well, who knows? Well, we wouldn't be Norwegians if we allowed this thing to run over time. You're always eager to fulfill national stereotypes. Uh, I will now bring this session to an end. Next Thursday, uh, we will have another guest lecture, but it's going to be a mystery lecture because I was informed today that um, uh, Dr. Klose, who, um, Fabian Klose, who was coming over from Germany, has had an accident, and I hope you all join us in, in um, wishing him the very best for his recovery, but he will not be able to attend the lecture. And we are in dialogue with some rather interesting 
uh, potential replacements. And I assure you, there will be a lecture on the 12th, Thursday. Uh, so please come, and uh, I'm sure you will be pleasantly surprised. Thank you so much. Until then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.